Making It Grow is brought to you in part by Santee Cooper, South Carolina's state-owned electric and water utility. More information on green power and energy conservation programs online at SanteeCooper.com. The South Carolina Department of Agriculture, reminding you that certified South Carolina agricultural products help make South Carolina grow. McLeod Farms in Macby, South Carolina. This family farm offers seasonal produce, including over 22 varieties of peaches. Glory Foods, celebrating Southern food with a soulful heritage. Glory Foods, a way of inviting South Carolina back to the dinner table. FTC Diversified, a proud part of your local communities, providing communication, entertainment, and security. Art Fields, a 10-day art competition in Lake City, South Carolina. Additional funding provided by International Paper. Well, for once, I'm not going to wave my hands around because I've got one of our special guests that you're going to learn all about a little later in the show. Um, you know, it's kind of dry right now, but our, our farmers are glad because they are taking advantage of this weather to get in the fields and get the corn and the soybeans and the peanuts out of the ground and to the market. And we hope every one of them has a successful year. Hello, I'm Amanda McNulty with Clemson Extension, and I'm so glad you could join us tonight. We have an hour of gardening information with SCE TV own show, Making It Grow, and we come to you live from historic downtown Sumter. Uh, we can't wait for you to come be with us tonight. We've got all kinds of fascinating things that are going on, and we want to answer your questions, so please take advantage of that toll-free number and call us up and let us know if we can help you with something that's puzzling you in your garden or your landscape, your shrubs or your trees. And tonight we have a wonderful visit with you. We're going to take you back to the gloriful days of being campers and you're going to see the tremendous fun that a group of special campers have when they go to the outdoor laboratory at Camp Hope at Clemson University. We've got so much to do and so many fun people here tonight so let's go inside and meet our guest. And Miss Teresa Lott, I'm going to hand my snake off in just a minute. Um, Miss Teresa Lott is a water quality expert with Carolina Clear and she's based in Florence and um, Teresa, if we um, did decide we had to wash our car because of all the pecan sap that's fallen out from the aphids, <laughs> um, should we wash it on the grass or on the driveway? That is an excellent question, Amanda. I'm glad you asked. The best thing you can do is to take your car and park it on the grass if you're going to wash it at home. There's all kinds of nasty things on your car that you want to wash off and get it clean. Uh, little bits of grease and even toxic uh, heavy metals from the brake dust. And when we wash it in a, on a hard surface, all of that can flow into our storm drains and ditches and directly to waterways where it can have a negative impact on our water quality. So washing it on the grass will allow those pollutants to be filtered out by nature. Even better, you could consider taking your car to a commercial car wash where they're going to clean and recycle the wash water. It's also good for conservation. It uses far less water than you would use at home. If you'd like more tips, simply go to the Carolina Clear website, clemson.edu slash Carolina Clear. If you'd like to join me this evening in the chat room, all you have to go do is go to the Making It Grow Facebook page. Once you're there, click on the green Let's Talk icon. Be sure you're using your favorite web browser and not the mobile application. That will save you lots of headaches. So click on the icon. You'll be directed into the chat room. You can log in with Facebook, Twitter, or Rumble Talk. We've got five speakers, three viewers so far, and I hope those numbers grow so that we'll be chatting and solving your gardening questions. Amanda, back to you. Thank you, Teresa, and oh, I am so happy tonight to welcome Carlin Muddlin. Carlin and I were co-workers for a long, long time, and Carlin retired. <laughs> <laughs> and Carlin, you live in Hemingway, and have you been driving the combine? 
Well, they really won't let me very often. They say I miss too much. <laughs> so I'm the errand woman. <laughs> but Carlin, um, tonight's a special night, and you came back to remind our viewers of um, an unfortunate part of your life and, um, and that it's turned out with a beautiful, happy ending. But um, tell us about why we're here and why we're wearing pink tonight, please. Well, October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and making it grow always um, seems to remember that every October. And I'm a five-year survivor. And I just wanted to remind every woman that, you know, it's very important to take care of yourself and check. I've had my mammograms very routinely, and even with that, I did not know I had breast cancer. And, you know, you don't always see a lump, and you just don't always know. But if there's anything at all different, you need to check it out. And so I hope every woman will keep that in mind, and that way they can continue gardening and be happy and wear pink. And there you go. <laughs> remind and, um, everyone. And so now you get to be at home, and I think you're cooking for your sons and trying to encourage them to carry on the farming tradition. Yes. And we are, thank you for taking time out tonight to join us back here. Thank you for asking me. Yeah. Glad you got your hair on your head for yes. many times, no, a long time. Carlin, you know, Carlin said, this is what it is. And she came with scarves yeah. on her head and, yeah. um, and she went through it like a trooper. And um, she's a good example to all of us of overcoming adversity. Thank you. Um, Vicki burton -Arley has pink all over. Vicki, honest to goodness, I don't know what to do. <laughs> um, but Vicki, of course, is our horticulture agent in Lexington and Aiken, and she's an entomologist. She brings so much to the show. And um, so tell me what's happening in the world of horticulture and entomology right now. Are the insects finally, you know, they, they, it hasn't been that cold. I feel like they're still out there. Um, you know what? It's, it is getting a lot cooler. They are slowing down. Slowing down. Um, they're still there, but they're, they're moving a lot slower than normal because they're very dependent on temperature. Um, and so they're going to start getting ready to go into their, their winter um, torpor and, and start overwintering as, as most of them in a pupil stage. But they're going to start setting up for winter, and we'll see more of them in a few months. And we'll get questions about ladybugs coming in the house, won't we? Ladybugs, kudzu bugs, and stink bugs are going to be coming in our the house. questions. Yep. All right. Well, and we have someone who just wouldn't mind in the least bit, I don't think, if those things came into our house, and that's Shannon Unger. She's from the Ruth Patrick Science Education Center at the wonderful campus, University of South Carolina at Aiken. And tell us what kind of fascinating creatures you've brought to visit us tonight. Well, man, I'm so glad to be here. I brought um, scaly and slimy and feathery friends. Um, it's the uh, the month of spooky times, and often these are considered kind of spooky or nighttime creatures. But I do want to share with your viewers that while maybe a little spooky, they're just wonderful creatures to have around. Thank you. Well, and I'm going to um, take offense at that slimy. I think we should say moist. I think frogs and toads are moist. I moist think that's is a probably a nicer word. A nicer way to describe them than slimy, but that's just thank my you. take on it. Okay. And thank you so much for bringing those with us. And now we're going to check in with our favorite professor at the University of South Carolina, and that would be none other than John Nelson. Hey, John, how are you? Hello, Amanda. I'm doing well. Oh, and, uh, you, and you're dressed appropriately. Here. Thank you so much for, for joining us in, in our breast cancer awareness activities. Well, I would, um, I'm glad that um, I'm able to take part and um, sport my bright pink um, golf shirt. Well, it's, it's very becoming, and I hope that if you ever play golf, you um, have a fairly good game. I didn't know that that was one of your skills. <laughs> Well, I'm, I don't know anything about golf. Oh, okay. But I, think it's like a golf <laughs> I think it looks like a golf shirt. <laughs> well, John, um, you give such a wonderful free service. Gosh, something free to the citizens of South Carolina. Because um, if we can, if we find something, we don't know what it is, and um, if it's a plant, not if it's a reptile or something moist, um, we can send it to you, and you'll tell us what it is almost overnight. So, what's the best way to get in touch with you if we're being, if we're, if we're puzzling over something? Well, um, you know, our service is free for anyone, and I hope that just because it's free doesn't mean that it's worthless, because we do get a lot of people um, asking us um, questions about plants. If you have a plant, folks, that um, you're wondering about, we'd be happy to take a look at an image that you might have. You could send it as a as a um, email attachment. That works quite well. And uh, if you're close enough to Columbia that you could drop it by, uh, the herbarium would be happy to run out and uh, pick it up for you, or you can come in the building and we'll show you around the herbarium. That'll work too. All righty. Well, we appreciate it, and we'll come back a little later for a mystery plant. And um, is it a pink plant tonight, or is it just a green plant? Uh, 
It's going to be a pink plant. Well, how about that? Well, we just can't <laughs> wait. Thank you so much, John. We'll be back with you in just a little bit. All right. And we have our first caller, and I think it is Glenda, and she's calling us from Traveler's Rest. Thanks so much for calling us up tonight. How can we help you? Oh, I watch your program every week and enjoy it very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I have two large rows of Sharon bushes. Uh -huh. and oh, I would so like to, Yes, they are. And I would like to know if I could trim them back now or should I wait till like February? Okay. Um, she's got two wonderful rows of Sharon, Althea. And, you know, they do well in sandy soils and good soils, and they just that's just a, a wonderful plant. And hers have gotten kind of big, Carl, and she wants to know if she should go ahead and cut them back now or if she should wait a little later. Well, I think I would wait till after frost um, just to make sure that, you know, that that you're, you're just not going to stimulate any, right, growth. any growth. And I'm sure this late we probably wouldn't, but um, I would wait till the frost comes. You know, I've been looking, and... The forecast through the end of the month is going to be the high. It's going to actually be cool, warmer next cooler. week. Mm -hmm. And even so, I feel like I think this is a wise time for us not to do too much early pruning. Would yeah, you agree? Yeah, I, I think some folks are going to get excited because it's still warm and they want to mm -hmm. prune just because they think it's still you know a little bit of summer left. Mm -hmm. And it's just not a good idea because um, it's not unheard of for it to for it to frost yeah. at the mm -hmm. beginning of November. Okay. And if she's going to prune it. You know, the sooner you prune it, though, the uglier it stays yeah. longer. So that might be she something could to think about. She could March wait she also yeah. if yeah. she's yeah. going to really prune it. There lot. you go. Yeah. Um, Elizabeth's calling us from West Ashley, and we're glad to hear from you down in that part of the world. And um, what's going on? Well, I've got a question about daylilies. I'm right. getting ready to transplant some daylilies and wanted to find out should I cut the tops off of them? Um, when I uh, move them. Thanks so much, and I'll um, listen out for your answer. All right. Well, it sounds like the tops are still green, and she's kind of wondering about it. Um, we have kind of a, a theory about cutting green tops, don't we, Vicki? Um, I like to leave the green tops on um, until they start to wilt and just look terrible. Then I trim them off um, just because because they're they're they've got a lot of energy in those roots, and the sooner you cut the leaves off, those, the, that's the energy center. So, and Carla, so even though I'd she's going to transplant them, um, will they they'll, will they help if, by leaving the green leaves on? Will they help? I those wonder roots if generate? maybe I know what she's saying. After she digs them up, they probably are going to start to wilt. Now, I'm wondering if you just couldn't trim them a little bit, you know, like you do when you're making cuttings um, to mm -hmm. propagate or something, yeah. just to get the ratty part off and still leave, say maybe Any, it, the, the good, two or three of the good. sturdier. That's close Kinda to like the ball. Whenever you do irises, right? You yeah, know, that sounds like, like a that. good compromise. Thank you all. Okay, um, another call from down in the Low Country. This time from Charleston, Savannah. This is getting confusing. Savannah <laughs> is calling us from Charleston, but we're awfully happy to hear from you, Savannah. And what's going on in your yard that we can help you with tonight? Hey, I love your show. Well, thank um, you. I'm calling because I have two TOs in my yard. They're about nine years old, and they've always done very well. But in the past month or so, all the tips of all the leaves have turned brown. And, and they're, they're still have, blooming. They're two what? I'm sorry, Savannah. Tell me what they were again. Tea olive trees. Oh, tea olives. Okay, thank you. Yes, they're beautiful. But the tips have all of a sudden turned brown on all the leaves. And they're still blooming. They look pretty healthy, except for the tips of every leaf has turned brown. And I was wondering if you all could help me with that. Are you, are you irrigating a lot? I haven't been. Um, you know, they, they're pretty established, though. Fertilized. I haven't really been watering them anymore. You didn't fertilize them any, did you? I didn't fertilize them, no. Well, shoot. <laughs> Everything we were hoping you'd done so that we could answer the question. Carlin, you got any yeah, ideas? Yeah, lots of times that's a water issue, either too much or not enough. Well, it has been dry lately. And if it's all over the plant, then you know the whole root ball is being affected. Um, so maybe she's just got particularly well-drained soil, and I don't know. Well, the only thing I can think of is that she could get something very narrow and slender and long and probe around them a little bit and just try to see how dry that ground really is. I can't imagine it being that dry, but, I you know, I don't live in that area, so I don't know when's the last time well, they've had rain. Well, and hopefully since they are well-established, um, 
you know, I would be certain that you've got a good mulch on them, and I would go ahead and feel in the soil, and it may be that you need to give them some water. Because, you know, they might have a pretty, you know, they've got a lot of leaves they're trying to support. Mm -hmm. And that's and, not going to correct the brown because that's, no, that's dead. But it might it's keep not it, gonna, but it might right, help the tree kind of make it through. If the soil feels dry, mm -hmm. she could go ahead and irrigate. And again, be sure you've got a mulch. Sometimes people forget about mm -hmm. that mulch. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty important for insulating the soil and helping that it holds the whole soil moisture, moisture in. Yeah. Doesn't yeah. let it evaporate as fast yeah. either. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, um, we are afraid that Dr. Dr. John may evaporate if we wait too long to check back up with him because he's got a nice porch out on the back and it's a beautiful night and he might want to go to sit out there and look at the stars. So, Dr. John, we're going to come back to you and go ahead and find out about this fascinating mystery plant. Amanda, that's a good idea. I think I might have to go out onto the deck in a little while and. Uh, postulate about things. I think if but, I were with you, I would do the same thing. And I'd probably go by the refrigerator and open up and see if there was something in there to carry out there with me. There might be something in there. There might be. But we're not going to go out onto the deck until after we talk about our beautiful mystery plant. All righty. Which is a, a native species. You know, we like to have native species. Um, native species such as um, John Seeley and Keith Mearns, who sometimes appear in my photos. In a, a savanna, this plant um, has beautiful pink flowers, sort of uh, in fashion with uh, tonight. Beautiful pink corollas, and this is, an, as I said, it's a native species that grows pretty much all over the state, not just in savannas or flatwoods, but sometimes in um, regular old fields. It's old fields, and you can see it uh, in basically all the counties. The petals are all fused together, and it's got um, a couple of little yellow marks. They look like little um, uh, road stripes down the, the middle of the road, and those are, for, of course, for the bees to look at when they're pollinating the flower. Oh, uh -huh. And uh, five petals, and you can see that they're um, fused together into this uh, tubular arrangement. And um, I bet some of you all know what this is, and you're probably even able to recognize it. This is probably related to <clears throat> our cultivated foxgloves. Nice. So it is in the uh, foxglove family. Um, do you have any of those ghastly puns or tips that you sometimes <laughs> come up with? <laughs> <laughs> you mean those excellent puns? No, of course. Excuse me, I missed um, a really big tip this time. Well, it's... it's um, it blooms in the fall, in the autumn. Okay, so autumn something. <laughs> and sometimes people think that um, the little flowers look like um, bells. Okay. Autumn that... bells. <laughs> yeah, autumn bells. <laughs> autumn bells. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> oh, we're so excited. <laughs> well, John, does so it have um, the compounds that foxglove, does foxglove, doesn't it have some compounds uh, in it? Uh, well, now, foxglove, digitalis, has a lot of um, pretty powerful uh, compounds within its tissues. I'm not really sure that um, agalinus uh, really does. Okay. And they're, they're, not, they're more like distant cousins in the oh. same family. They're oh. not the same thing. Well, they sure are pretty. And is it a, a little perennial, herbaceous perennial that dies and comes back every year? Uh, the way I understand it, this one is a perennial. There are some annual species, okay. and um, these are just beautiful, beautiful native species. And um, if, you're, if you're good at growing natives, this might be one to try. I was going to say, that'd be pretty to have in your yard this time of year, to have that beautiful little color running around. Well, John, thank you so much. That was wonderful. And if you go outside, say hello to Orion or Saturn or anybody you see out there, okay? All right, I'll see what's out there. We'll see you next week. All right. Okay. And now we're going to find out what's happening in the chat room. And um, I know that Teresa's got some interesting topics being discussed there. Teresa? Well, you're right, as always, Amanda. It's always interesting in the chat room. And we have jumped up our participation to 16 speakers and six viewers. So we could say it's a full house, but I don't think we've maxed out our capacity. So if you still want to join in the chat room discussion, there's absolutely room for you. And uh, we've had some people talking since it is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Um, someone asked that we mention that men can actually get breast cancer as well. It's very rare, less than 1% of all breast cancers occur in men, I believe. 
but it, it does happen. And uh, someone else pointed out that certainly there are lots of different forms of cancer, and um, not all of them are as recognized as breast cancer. So we here at Making It Grow certainly do um, encourage awareness for all the cancers in terms of um, recognizing how many people are affected and also research to uh, make cures so that people don't have to suffer. Remember, you can join in. Still 16 speakers, 6 viewers. I'd love to have you join me. Amanda, back to you. Thank you. I'm glad you got such a nice group in there. And um, are some, uh, there are so, always some regulars, and I think they're like old friends to Teresa now. Uh, Mary's calling us from Somerville. We're getting a lot of calls from the lower part of the state. Oh, wow. yeah. I'm, I, but not Hemingway. I'm waiting for Hemingway. <laughs> Carlin's <laughs> home town needs to be included. But uh, Mary, thank you so much for taking the time to call us. And how can we help you tonight? Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, I have some well-established lantana. It's uh -huh. the yellow lantana, right. and um, they have spots all over them. It's like, um, not sure if it's like a mildew or what it is, but they are not blooming very well at all. The ones that have the these spots all over them do not bloom, are not blooming, but the other ones, look, I have some other ones maybe 10 feet away, and they're, they look beautiful. Are they the same species, um, variety? Did you buy them all at the same time, or do you think you've added over the years and they're kind of different? I have added some over the years, but um, they are the same, the same type. Not the same. Okay. Um, what do you think, Vicki? Well, lantana is usually pretty hardy, and it's they don't usually get anything. Um, I'd say it's it's stressed out, and so it's it ended up getting a leaf spot um, of some type. Um, I don't know exactly what it is. Well, how about that lantana lace bug? Lace that can bug. prevent them from blooming, I think, can it? Right. Well, it tell does. us what you. Yes. What, what is your it idea? It affects on that? mine greatly. Um, it just, I mean, it'll stunt them in growth. The the leaves look like she says, like they have a mildew on them. And if you look real closely, you can find them um, on there. And you know what I do is just trim them back and try to get all some of the ugly off. I don't mm -hmm. know this late that that's really that you, necessary, yeah. but you can get like um, I just use like some of the hose in insecticides like once and done or triazoside mm -hmm. and just drench them down good and. They'll but as you back. say, this late in the year, it might not be, but maybe keep I it I still near. would spray them. Mm -hmm. I just would hate to see them going into the winter with that kind of damage. Um, yeah, infestation and that heavy of a, you know, yeah. uh, damage on them. So, so you think if she looks at them closely, she'll be able to see I if that is what it is. I know she probably will. And otherwise, if it's just... flip the leaf over. Yeah, okay, right. flip the leaf over and look on, on the, the underside side. and maybe and take a magnifying glass. And they're very clear and small, but they, you can, you know, you and you'll see, see the them move dark, around. Yeah, and you'll see the dark specks. Okay, well, well thank you. Release. Thank you all so much. Uh, my next caller comes from Lexington. We're glad to talk to you tonight, Al. Thank you for calling us. And um, are you in the part of Lexington that has those exquisitely drained soils? Yes. <laughs> yes <I am. laughs> well, then we're not going to tell you that you got a moisture problem. <laughs> well, what's, yeah, yeah. what's happening over there? That, what, what's happening that we might be able to help you with? I enjoy your show very much. I want to let you. you know that. Thank you so much. I have a red maple. A red maple, okay. And it's about six years old. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't. I bought it for the color. It turns red in the autumn. Uh huh. In the fall, and it doesn't turn red. I know, I know, I know. Um, what is that? That, well, the problem is because you live in Lexington, South Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> um, tell us about these fancy cultivars that perform are developed and perform so beautifully up north when they take a picture of them and then we plant it down here where it's hot. What happens, Carlin? I don't know. All of mine turn. <laughs> I guess I live in Hemingway. That's why. <laughs> well, well, and you may ha I mean, and you may not well, be expecting spectacular right. And he colors. needs to make sure that's what he has. I know like a trident maple, it, there's some that really don't turn they go from green to brown but right. there are also some they i believe usually, called some, autumn blaze and autumn yeah, glory and, and they, they just, don't perform as well right. they're meant to be more more northern than what we are right. i mean and they'll so, grow fine but they mm -hmm. just won't develop they won't the color change the color the same as bright as um, yeah. it's just okay. like reason the fall colors aren't as spectacular I mean, down here than they are north. so you have lower <laughs> yeah. expectations because yeah. you're just glad to have everything be pretty and you just like mm -hmm. native plants but you know but somebody who thought they were going to have some blaze of glory yeah, yeah. might be disappointed yes but if you're from you know above the mason dixon, dixon line <laughs> Your trees don't get excited about the color down here. <laughs> but you know what? We have some, our hickories turn beautiful, don't they? Yeah. Mine turn green, yellow, and then fall off. And the right. sweet gum. The sweet gums, yeah. I think, are beautiful. And, the, and um, the Nissa, Nissa sylvatica is mm -hmm. a very beautiful mm -hmm. tree. So there are close. some that in the south Too will close. have beautiful color for you. 
Uh, Nick is calling us, and he's in Savannah, so we're glad his name isn't Charleston calling us from Savannah, <laughs> which would have been switched on what we had earlier. Nick, thank you so much for calling us tonight. And uh, what's happening we can help you with? Okay. okay. I, uh, I have a, a four uh, trees of pomegranates. They're 20 feet tall, okay? Ooh. 20 feet tall. Uh -huh. And uh, I didn't have about 12 fruits out of four of them. I had a plenty of blooms. I mean, blooms so beautiful, those red blooms, you know. Mm -hmm. But they all fell down, and I watered it. I fertilized it a little bit. I took care of them, you know. And uh, they just uh, they just didn't give me nothing for two years in a row. And the first year and second year, I had plenty because I, I got them growing up from a farm. And uh, I just don't know what to do to prune them down uh, or what to do. With. So the first couple of years, you did have a lot of fruits on them. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, bushels. Mm -hmm. But you're, you, now how much fertilizer are you giving them? Are you fertilizing them throughout the summer, or what would you say? I do. I, uh, I buy a lot of cow manure, you know, the black mangoes. I uh -huh. put a half a bag around them, you know, and I water them a lot. And, uh, but uh, nothing happens. Okay. Well, I think pomegranates traditionally grow in kind of more arid and and. and mineral sorts of soil so what do you think might be happening do you have any suggestions or ideas? I kind of wonder if he's over fertilized a little bit and um, at the expense of growing a lot of foliage and not a lot of fruit uh -huh. um, mm -hmm. I think maybe that's that could be part of it um, you know maybe, you see them in old yards don't we Carl and like I mean I know in the little town I live in St. Matthew's old houses right, just have right. parents, and they weren't taken care of and they often would have plenty of fruits they seem to Maybe, do you think maybe that just kind of making it a Maybe he's loving it too much? Yeah. <laughs> well, he mentioned pruning. Could he be pruning at the wrong time? And I think pruning he said he off? wondered if he should prune. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. We've well, got a fact sheet on pomegranate, though. We do. We do. And um, so tell them how to find that, please. Um, you can go to Clemson's HGIC. Um, it's uh, um, clemson.edu slash um, extension slash HGIC, I believe. And um, there's a fact sheet on pomegranate. Um, that'll tell you um, fertilizer requirements, when you should prune, some cultural uh, practices. But maybe and cut like that. back on the water some. Maybe make them, um, you know, try to get them to the mature phase more than the vegetative phase, and that right. might help some. Okay. Mm -hmm. And when I look anything up on the Clemson HGIC site, since I'm um, from a generation that doesn't know all that slashing and backing and all that kind of stuff. I just Google Clemson HGIC pomegranates. Yeah. Right. And that's an easy way to get there if you're not as immediately attuned to doing things a type of way as Miss Vicki is. Um, well, at any rate, we're going to... Uh, we're going to have a real treat. We're going to uh, let Vicki go over and visit with this tremendously exciting guest she has. And while she makes her way over to the side counter, we're going to check in with Teresa and find out a little more about her chats in the chat room. Teresa? Well, thanks, Amanda. You know, it's uh, all about growing and uh, conquering pests and dividing. So much going on in the chat room, but what great timing. So the question was about pomegranate, and I have a picture that is of a pomegranate and spooky to boot. Uh, this sort of reminds me of the movie Little Shop of Horrors. It looks like the Venus flytrap that's alive on there with the, the middle section that's split open to reveal the seeds inside. And the reason I wanted to show this was because pomegranates are touted to have lots of health benefits, including including being high in fiber. They are supposed to have one quarter of your recommended daily allowance of fiber in a single pomegranate. So how about that? And as the previous caller mentioned, beautiful, beautiful flowers bloom for a long period of time and they're attractive to hummingbirds. So lots of benefits of pomegranates. Let's check in with Vicki and Shannon at the side counter. Thanks, Teresa. Um, I've got a very special guest guests with me tonight. I've got <laughs> Shannon Unger from the Ruth Patrick Science Education Center at USC Aiken. And Shana, tell us a little bit about what Ruth Patrick Science Education Center does. Um, well, we really focus on education, mostly K through 12 education. We have school groups that come a lot and come see our animals. Um, we do science, uh, chemistry type experiments. We go to the planetarium, we go hiking, we go bird watching, uh, digging critters out of the pond and the soil. Um, and just generally teaching them about science and STEM education as well. So sometimes it's introducing kids to nature um, mm -hmm. and not just always plain education. Right, and 
often kids will be walking in the woods and they'll say, hey, is this hiking? And I say, it is hiking. I've had a kid one time say that I've only seen hiking on TV. Oh, so wow. just walking in the woods itself might be the experience that that kid needed. Very nice. Well, you said that you guys have a lot of animals. We do. Um, in addition to some of the ones that we're going to introduce tonight, what else do you guys have? Well, we have some alligators. We just got a brand new little baby, about a month old, cute as can be, named Holden. Uh, we have other snakes, and we have uh, turtles, and salamanders, and frogs, and toads, and I don't know. It changes a lot. We got snails, and beetles, and worms. And, you know, be surprised how excited kids get about worms. Oh, one, <laughs> worms. It must, the boys always love worms. Um, you've brought one of the toads with us tonight. I did. Um, over here is one of our large female toads that we use a lot in our programming. Um, she's just a big... Uh, a big beautiful girl. Uh, she's a southern toad. She's finally stopped hopping. She's been hopping all night. Um, the kids love to see her. We like to talk about how frogs and toads are amphibians, not reptiles, and how frogs and toads are different. Um, often they're confused um, with each other. So, so is it true that um, if, if they get juices on you, will you get warts? <laughs> well, I, I believe that old wives' tale came from the fact that they have these glands behind their eyes that kind of look like kidney beans right behind their eyes. And um, they can produce toxin that can irritate your hands, and, um, but not so much warts, so Vicki. They can also, if you ever had a dog that got a toad in its mouth, it gets all frothed up. Yeah. That's from that toxin coming from back their eyes. But warts, no. No okay. warts. Okay, no warts. Well, we've got two um, very nice <laughs> reptiles here. Um, tell us a little bit about what we've got. Sure, and even in the cage, too, there you might be kind of hiding. But these are all corn snakes. And corn snakes are very common to this area. And they're not venomous, they're obviously. They're not venomous, or we not be handling them, yes. But I do always tell the kids anything with the mouth can bite. So don't go picking up uh, snakes on the trail. Give them hugs and kisses because I, I was holding one. Um, these guys have been handled a lot. Um, they're, they're quite docile since we've been handling them so much. Mm -hmm. But uh, what you're holding right there is the normal coloring, corny there. It um, has the coloring you would see that would be nice and camouflaged in leaf litter. Where the one I'm holding, Casper, which is a good name for this month, um, would not hide very well unless his environment consists of white pillowcases, which it does not. So I'm glad that we have him because he wouldn't make it very long in the wild. Now what... Um what kind of things do these eat? Well, in, at uh, the Ruth Patrick Science Education Center, they eat little uh, rats that are not alive anymore. Um, and sometimes they even eat crickets and sometimes they even eat worms. Okay. Um, we've got another lovely little guest here. Mm -hmm. um, he, uh, she's, she's awfully small, but it looks <laughs> like an owl. Um, can you tell us a little bit about her? Sure. I'll see if I can get her to turn around a little bit. Oh, well, then she's going to turn the other way. That's how they work. Um, right here in front of you, oh, <laughs> there we go, is a Miss Lina. Now, Miss Lina came to us, as did all our birds, because of an injury. Um, unfortunately, you can see on her left eye, it doesn't properly um, get larger and smaller according to the light that so comes in. she's not releasable. She's not releasable, and she can't see all that well of that, that eye, we believe. Okay. Um, but she, uh, she came to us. She's been wonderful with the children. She is what's called screech owl. Screech owls are real common in this area. But and this is as big as it'll get, right? And she's a girl. She's even a big one for a, a screech owl. So okay. she's even a big girl. And um, she ha she's housed with another big girl and a little boy. Um, and the kids love her. Um, she makes kind of a hoarse sound, a whoo, whoo, sound at night. If you ever hear that walking outside or in your yard, that might be a screech owl, right? right um, living in your tree. Very nice. Well, I've also brought um, some insects with me um, that I kind of want to show everybody. Um, in the extension office, we get a lot of phone calls about... Um, worms on the tomatoes, and um, they're actually tobacco hornworms um, instead of tomato hornworms, but um, there's a little bit of difference between the two. But these are normal size caterpillars. These are very, very large. Um, I had a, an older gentleman come in one day, and it was kind of neat. He had a jar, a mason jar of these things, and there was five of them in there, and, and they were so large that you could, you could hear their mouth parts scratching on the glass. It was, it was amazing, and he was like, are these mutants? What is this? Um, but they actually turn into a very nice um, sphinx moth. Um, this is a hawk moth um, in the family Sphingidae. 
very spectacular, very large, um, some of the largest moths that we have around. Um, another insect that I brought, um, in the news lately we've had um, a lot of folks talk about camel crickets. And it's not that they're anything new, but we've had these actually for a number of years now. And camel crickets tend to be in environments with high humidity, like the basement or in crawl spaces, underneath stairs, things like that. Um, and it's, it's nothing new. Um, we have had these for a while and pest control operators treat them with baits and it's actually pretty effective, pretty easy to get rid of. Um, but this is something that we've, we've had for a long time. It's, it's nothing new. So, but um, now we've got, this is, this is the favorite the thing that we've been looking for all <laughs> night. Um, who is this? Well, uh, Vicki, this is Raleigh. Raleigh is a barred owl that lives with us at Ruth Patrick Science Education Center. And he, unfortunately, is not releasable as well. Um, he has a broken wing that didn't fully heal. So mm -hmm. he can fly, but not very straight, which makes it hard to get little scurrying mice to eat. Um, both of these guys and most raptors that come in from injury is from being hit by a car, okay. which often happens when you get trash and food on the road. So it's all the more reason not to litter, right. not to throw things out. If keep you're our, gonna, put them, put your trash in proper places. Right, right, and um, that will keep our birds more safe. And um, if you even look, uh, we have uh, Raleigh barred owl, and then we had a little, little screech line in the front, and we even have a uh, taxidermy gray horned owl. So those are three of the four local owls that live here. And what's the fourth um, one? A barn owl. A so barn, barn owl. owls are white with a heart-shaped face. Okay. And all of them are nocturnal. And they all, they have those flat faces, so they're not as fast as, say, a hawk could fly, which is very aerodynamic, but they have very silent flight, so they can sneak up on their prey, um, where a hawk would use speed more than sneaking. Okay. Now, we kind of have to be careful where we are placement-wise, right. because naturally... We have a big food chain here. Okay. <laughs> we do. It's well, even larger than this, but naturally, Raleigh... Raleigh might eat a bird like Lina. Okay. Um, Raleigh might eat a snake or a toad or all kinds of things, or even some of those yummy insects. So, um, yeah, so we, we keep them separate, but they're well-fed, so I don't think they're going to give us too much of a fuss. Well, thank you so much, and we're going to come back to you later in the show and, and talk a little bit about um, how to get in touch with you and, and the Ruth Patrick Science Education Center down at USC okay. Aiken. Thank you, Vicki. Thanks, Shannon. Thank you. Uh, Teresa is going, we're going to check in with Teresa um, in the chat room. What a fascinating segment. I'm a little jealous. My chatters know and anyone who knows me real well that I absolutely love snakes. Well, I pretty much love any kind of animal. Um, so it was really nice to have all those uh, reptiles and amphibians and birds and insects right over there at the side counter. Now, keeping with that spooky thing, I've theme, I have a spooky photo to share with you, or maybe it's more stinky than spooky. If you can see kind of this orange structure, sort of octopus-like coming out of the grass, this is one of the stink horn fungi. And uh, it starts out beneath the soil as sort of this egg-like shape, and then depending on what species it is, you'll have a different shape above ground. That's the fruiting body. And, you know, it really is fascinating because the stinky smell, even though not pleasant to humans, actually serves a purpose. It's to attract uh, flies and things to come to that fungus and take the spores and spread them elsewhere so it can make more of itself. Mother Nature really is amazing. So even though you might not appreciate them in your backyard, they're usually relatively short-lived and they'll go away on their own and won't cause any problems to your plants. Still time to chat with us. Join in the chat room. I think we have about 25 people or so in there. And I just had to ask someone to repeat themselves because I've lost their questions. So many conversations going on at once. But you can come in and help us answer questions too. Amanda, back to you. The more the merrier, eh, Teresa? Um, and Shirley is calling us from Salisbury. We're glad to get a call from you tonight. And um, what's happening up your way? Uh, hello, yes, Amanda. I would like to ask you a question. I have some beautiful rooster cones. Uh -huh. And um, I would like to know how do you dry the rooster cones for dried flowers? Okay. I have some that's like 15 inches in the width part and 10 inches in the length. They are beautiful. They are. And, um, you know, I had um, coxcomb um, celosia in my hat last week. It's a beautiful, beautiful plant, and it does look like a rooster's comb, especially the large ones. Um, I have had some luck. Have y'all tried drying them? What have you, what have you tried? Um, I've tried just 
I, I kind of hang, I like to hang stuff up um, whenever I dry down. things. Hang them upside um, I down. I hang it upside mm -hmm. down. I usually um, will uh, clothes pin it to a hanger yes. um, and hang it in a closet. Where it's dark where so it's the sun dark. won't bleach it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that would be a real good way of going about it. Um, I tried putting them in glycerin one time and that didn't work. I had more luck hanging them upside down. I used to, um, for my, my prom and homecoming things yes. like that, I used to spray them with hairspray. Oh, um, okay. But you have to be careful not to put too much because then they get sticky. Ooh, yeah, that um, wouldn't be good. So I just yeah. put just a little bit just to, just to help preserve it a little. Okay. And um, I hung it up dark closet and they did fine. All right. Well, I hope that you will have good luck with them, Shirley. Um, we had a wonderful trip earlier this summer. Um, it was a beautiful day. We went to a beautiful part of the state. The outdoor laboratory is on the Clemson campus and lots of things go on there. And this summer while we were there, they were having a camp for um, some really excited campers and you're going to enjoy seeing what their day was like, a day at Camp Hope at the Clemson Outdoor Laboratory. We're in Clemson, South Carolina at the Outdoor Laboratory part of Clemson University, and I'm with Leslie Conrad, who is the director here. Leslie, tell me what goes on at this wonderful facility. Sure, absolutely. Well, we are part of the Parks, Recreation, and Tourism Management Department at Clemson, and we operate as a retreat center um, for a majority of the year for different groups, special events, um, and our favorite time of year is summer and we do residential summer camps for children, teenagers, and adults with various types of disabilities and special needs. And so they get to go camping and swimming and all kinds of fun things, but y'all, a couple of years ago, had a great idea. What happened? Right, well, we, we do like to give our campers experiences that they're not getting other places. So program-wise, we're a very traditional camp. And several years ago, we had a staff member who um, had the skills necessary to start a camp garden, which we loved the idea and had wanted to do and needed the right person to get it done. And so we started a camp garden. Um, we uh, had the small strip of land behind our swimming pool. And so we were able to add that activity to our campers schedule in the summer. Um, and so over the years, we've kind of developed diff a few different things in the garden. And so it's now an integral part of our program. What are some of the things that um, the campers like to do when they come to the garden? Well, they come as a cabin group, and so they're able to walk through the garden, see some of the things that are growing. Um, our activity leader in the program, Jenny, um, she will show them different types of plants, talk about how things grow. Um, it's great for our campers to know that uh, food doesn't just appear in the grocery store. Um, so she teaches them kind of the start to finish, and they're actually able to pick some things, plus they help tend it. And so there's a lot of hands-on and tactile feeling. How about smelling and tasting? Absolutely. Um, we engage all the senses because our campers do have different special needs um, and disabilities. So um, we might use things that are more touch and smell oriented for our campers who have a visual impairment. Um, and then she lets them taste things. Um, and so there's lots of senses engaged. And do you um, talk afterwards? Do y'all continue to ch chat with them during the week and ask them how they felt about the garden? What is the, sure. What's some of the feedback you've got? We do. Um, we always have an activity that they get to do um, that kind of incorporates what they learned in the garden. And so they might actually get to pick something and deliver it to the kitchen, which they love to do. Um, and so the campers really enjoy it. And even if they are picking something and carrying it to the kitchen, they feel like they grew it from start to finish. So. They, they really enjoy it. You've got a second tier that isn't planted yet. Right. And that, you said, some of the campers, that really helps them to kind of get into the dirt. Sure, it does. It puts, some of our campers are older and have a little trouble getting down on the ground and looking at, at things at the base of a plant. And so what that does is it allows them to walk 
eye level, so or counter level, um, so we can have, they can see things growing um, in a way that they don't have to bend over or crouch down. And they get excited about things like the insects and the pollinators and things they and the do. flowers. Is all of that a part of the Absolutely, experience? Absolutely, they do. They learn about those things and they definitely get excited. Um, some more than others about the bugs, but they, they appreciate it and learn lots. So you feel like um, regardless of the disability, you have some people who have vision problems mm -hmm. or hearing problems or mm -hmm. cognitive problems. Um, you found that the garden can speak to everybody. Absolutely. There's something that every camper can do um, or experience here. And that's one of the things underlying the philosophy of our program that campers get a chance to do all of the activities and we can meet them where they are as far as, as their abilities. And so the garden is a perfect place for that. Do you think they take some of these ideas home and share them with other people, with their friends or coworkers? Absolutely, I do. I think that um, because they're seeing things that are very common, like a tomato or a pretty flower or a squash, that that's going to resonate with them when they get home and see it and they remember their time with Jenny and what they learned about it. So absolutely, it's combining education and fun, which is what camp does. And I think probably that I can see that in the in the future, y'all are probably going to take walks in the woods and you'll see things there that are edible. I can see that this is going to go lots of ways sure. because this is nestled in such a beautiful place. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All the smiles and happiness I've seen here today make me wish I could come and participate with you. And I think you have a lot of volunteers and also organizations that help support camp. Sure. We, um, we have, our camps are made possible by the South Carolina JCs as well as the Sertomans of South Carolina and the Lions Club out of Anderson supports a week of camp as well. And so those folks work hard to make it possible for our campers to come. And um, folks can learn more about our programs at our website, um, www.clemson.edu um, slash outdoor lab. Well, we've had a wonderful time, and I can't wait to get in here and see these kids having fun with tomatoes and corn. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Come anytime and join us. Thank you. What a fun experience. And they've got some campers there who've been coming for 30 years. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah isn't that fun? And um, so, it really, so it really is just a wonderful family. People get to see their friends. They come back right, and you know, right. see their same friends that they've been coming to camp with for so many years. It's just a beautiful opportunity that Clemson and all these supporting groups offer to, um, to some of these people who have special needs. But they sure enjoy um, the same things that we do. And we're so glad they get to go to this beautiful place to participate. We had a good time. Thank you all for letting us come up to that great camp. Um, we've got a call. Lisa's calling us, and she is in Columbia, South Carolina, the capital city of our state. Lisa, what's going on up there in the capital city? Oh, hi. Um, I love your show. Thank you. Um, I, we just moved down here six months ago, uh -huh. so a lot of the plants are very new to me. Um, one thing I think is I have a ginger lily that's growing outside my deck, yeah. and it doesn't seem to flower. It's, it's very fragrant when it does, but I'm not really sure why it's not uh, flowering. I had it identified at the um, farmer's market because there's like a Clemson like cooperative. This sure is, yeah, there. yeah. Yes. So, um, is, it white, really sure is it the white? Is it the white ginger lily? It is the white ginger okay. lily, and and I pulled it up, and it does the the tuber does look like ginger. Oh. And uh, I just I'm not sure what to do. I mean, the deck gets full sun kind of over the summer, and uh -huh. then this time of year it's pretty much in the shade because the sun's so low. Okay. All right. Um, she's got one of those wonderful old butterfly ginger lilies. And, um, she, it bloomed a lot, and then it stopped blooming. So Something she said probably needs to divide them. She may Because they to. do get very, I mean, they grow very clumpy and very mm -hmm. quickly, and I've divided mine several times. And, you know, I think that's maybe, but she's got to find the right place for it, you know, when she divides it. And um, mine are mostly in sun. Uh, but I've had some in shade, and they don't bloom quite so much, mm -hmm. but they still bloom. Um, you know, you may, you, 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 you know, might, I just don't know. I, that's just the truth. I don't know because usually they just swim. But also, it's kind of getting to the end of their season also. Right. Right. They bloom more in the summer, and then as fall comes, they do wind down a good bit. So probably it's just the natural. Mine are spent. 
Nine, senescence yeah. that's coming. Yeah. But yeah. they'll come back next year, and um, they do like water. And if you've got them in yeah. full sun, they need more water than if they're in shade. They and do. they just smell wonderful. But I think what's happening is just the fall's coming. coming. And um, just, you know, things just say, well, you know, fall is coming, and it's time to kind of relax. But well, one thing that happens in South Carolina, at least in the Midlands where I live, is that dahlias that just sit there and go pooty wooty all summer, when fall comes, they get a little resurgence. And my friend Ann Dolce called me this morning, and she came by and brought me, I think, just this beautiful dahlia. And, um, of course, dahlias are um, it's an underground storage structure. And um, in some places, I believe, they have to dig them up. Mm -hmm. If it gets cold, like where your mother-in-law lives, to, you yeah, have they to have dig to overwinter them, up. them. Yep. But here, we can usually just leave them in the ground. And um, anyway, so, um, but I thought that was for Is that a fatsia with it? Too? Yeah, and I, and, well, just to set it off, I got a little fatsia leaf. And um, anyway. Dahlias have a different so. kind of smell. I wonder if a yeah, deer yeah. would eat them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Them. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh. Steve Snap, who um, works in Sumter um, for Sumter County, is, the ma is uh, in charge of all our maintenance and has been so nice to us at the Clips and Extension Office, brought these wonderful Asian persimmons in, and these are the non-astringent, because as you know, usually a persimmon has to be kind of goosely um, before you can eat it, or to turn your mouth inside out. But um, when you slice them, they have some very small seeds, but you don't even have to peel them. And tell me what you said when I just tried to make you eat one. Well, I, it, to me, whenever you were cutting it up, it sounded like it was raw. I mean, it didn't even sound like it was ripe because it was hard. Uh huh. Um, really but it was good. actually delicious. Very good. Very good. <laughs> very good. And very not good. the least bit puckery, is it? No. And not too sweet. You no, know, just, just a great, just great. And um, they're easy to grow, and they're available in lots of places now. I think Stan McKenzie has some. And this is the non astringent. And um, the only trouble I've ever had, Carla, was just a few white flies, and that's just kind of normal for South Carolina. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, I just love being in the car at noon or in the office to, where I can cut the radio in because I love Clipson's Your Day that comes on Monday, mm -hmm. Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And um, tomorrow, you can learn about your pet. And good, goodness gracious, we all know about that. Um, and this tells you some things that, like if your dog barks every time the doorbell rings when the trick-or-treaters come. So you'll get all kinds of good <laughs> tips tomorrow on Your Day on the Pet Health Show. And then on Thursday, the tech people are going to have something that would actually be helpful to me um, because they're going to tell me how to get the best out of your digital photographs so that oh, when your okay. kids come by in the costumes um, and look so cute that you'll actually get um, some cute pictures that you can look at and remind them of the years to come. So always Very check fun. out what's happening on the Clips and Your Day programs. It's just so much fun and that's from 12 to 1 on every single station on SCETV's radio, a great place to keep the dial set. Um, Shannon, it was such an incredible pleasure to have you come. And um, do you think maybe we could get you to um, come back again and regale us with some more of these wonderful animals who live right here in South Carolina? Well, I certainly would love to. I think um, these guys are really interesting, and I love to teach people more about them. Um, I'd love to come visit again if you can give me a chance. And it sounds like you'll have such a wonderful place down there. Remind us of how we can get in touch with you all, please. Um, you can always go on our website at rpsec.usca.edu, um, or you can always give me a call, 803-641-2843. That's 803-641-2843, or shoot me an email, shannonu at usca.edu, and come visit our animals, um, bring some kids to learn more about them. Um, teacher development opportunities, summer camps, we have a blast there. So please contact us and, and we can go from there. We'll have a grand time. Thank you. Thank you so much. And if you didn't get all that information, um, our wonderful Teresa Lott, who does so many things to help us here as part of Team Making It Grow, will probably post it on the Facebook page. <laughs> and Teresa, um, thank you so much for being here tonight. And did you, I bet, tell me what the most interesting thing y'all talked about tonight in the chat room was. Oh, goodness. I'm not sure if we can go with most interesting, although there was a story about an owl in an establishment that no one believed was real until someone decided they'd get close enough and stick their finger, and when that person got bit, then they realized that it was, <laughs> was real. So um, Tony should get a hoot.
quote out of me sharing that, that story <laughs> with everyone. Lots of great conversation though now. We've been talking a little bit about pruning and I've already noticed uh, the first crepe myrtle in my neighborhood. So some people will argue that they like the look of crepe myrtles being pruned and um, I certainly can't argue with people's opinion. However, it's not really the right time to prune. So if you're considering pruning, please do visit HGIC. Vicki mentioned how to get there or just do a Google search and look at what time you should prune different, um, different plants. It's different depending on whether they bloom on new growth or old growth, um, but just be sure to do that so you can have better success in your yard. And uh, do visit us on our Facebook page all week long. We'll do the best to uh, share your photos, photos and answer your questions. Amanda? Thank you. Carlin, you um, went shopping. And boy, ah. I can't believe what you got. Tell Can us you what believe it is. It. Yes, I go by my little nursery in Polly's Island and look what I find. This is a Camellia Sasanqua Margie Miller. And it is a prostrate growing Camellia that looks like it's going to be full of blooms. It's a Ooh. new plant from Monrovia. It can be used for containers. It can be used just as ground cover. So um, prostrate means that it's, it's not going to grow up. It's right. going to just kind of weep over. And exactly. And the uh, general it. idea is going to be about a foot tall uh -huh. and maybe four feet or so wide. And it's full of little pink flowers that I hopefully will be blooming here soon. I don't know if you can see the buds or not, but I'm excited to plant it and see what's going to happen. And you said it could take a little bit of sun since it's a right. Camellia Sasanqua. It so is. It's beautiful exactly in a container. Right. Ooh. And you I could know. have it in the container and then after it stopped blooming, you could move it, it somewhere else. And then you can move just, it oh, else. just so much fun, so much fun. Um, thank you so much, Vicki, for coming. It's such a pleasure. And you have the best insect collection. I just can't wait to go to Vicki's house and see what's <laughs> hanging on her walls. I have thank you again. Thank you. Thank you for everything. Me, and I love your pink streaks in your hair tonight. Thank you. <laughs> and Carlin, thank you for, um, for paying attention and for being thank proactive you. and taking care of yourself because um, you're mighty special to us. And we thank love you. it when you can come back and be with us. And we want you to be with us next week as you come back for another hour of Making It Grow. Night, night. Making It Grow is brought to you in part by Santee Cooper, South Carolina's state-owned electric and water utility. More information on green power and energy conservation programs online at SanteeCooper.com. The South Carolina Department of Agriculture, reminding you that certified South Carolina agricultural products help make South Carolina grow. McLeod Farms in Macby, South Carolina. This family farm offers seasonal produce, including over 22 varieties of peaches. Glory Foods, celebrating Southern food with a soulful heritage. Glory Foods, a way of inviting South Carolina back to the dinner table. FTC Diversified, a proud part of your local communities, providing communication, entertainment, and security. Art Fields, a 10-day art competition in Lake City, South Carolina. Additional funding provided by International Paper.